Hello, hello uh, to another cafe release, the uh, nighttime one uh, for us in London. If I look like a disheveled man who trying to put a toddler to bed, it's because I am one. But uh, <laughs> I had an excuse to skip and ask Persephilia, my wife, to take over because I've got a fantastic guest tonight. Uh, Michael, would you care to briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, no, please do call me Wheels, um, which is what I usually go by. Uh, it's when it, <laughs> this weird thing where uh, ever since I was a little kid, nobody has actually called me Michael. So now when people do, I'm like, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm Wheels. Um, I am the uh, head of video over at Dicebreaker.com, uh, which is a, um, a board game sort of review and news site. Uh, where we have our own YouTube channel as well, youtube.com for test icebreaker, which is what I'm in charge of. Um, but by night, I am an RPG designer and Twitch streamer. Um, you can find my stuff over on wheelsrpgs.com, wheelsrpgs.itch.io, uh, and I stream over on twitch.tv forward slash oh look, it's wheels. Uh, and most recently, I have just released, literally, it's just come out last week, um, my biggest project that I've ever done, uh, The House Doesn't Always Win which is a game of Risk and Revolution, uh, which is out now at those links that I just said. I was concerned because earlier I tweeted about this stream and I included the link to the Kickstarter and you were like, oh, it's over. And I was like, oh my God, for how for long has it been over? So just one week, I, I guess it's fine. Uh, I guess I'm not too behind the curve then. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Um, so I think we we finished up the crowdfunding in uh, December. So I think it's it's taken about four or five months and, oh, wow. and the game's out so it's yeah it's been it's been super quick um i was sort of talking to my designer after we finished and i was like you know like this is the first time i've done something this big but even then that feels really zippy like i feel like we've been pretty uh like pretty um on the ball with with uh with you know we've had like four artists to manage and there's like uh, six different writers who have come in for guest scenarios and stuff. So there's been a lot of things to manage, but you know it's all come in uh, on time, which is which has been really really uh, good. <laughs> it's been, it's on, been uh, on a lot time. Of off my shoulders. On time, a handful of months, just a typical project for a role playing game on Kickstarter. <laughs> so one of our traditional question is uh what is your routine like i would assume your routine change significantly with you reaching the end of your kickstarter fulfillment yeah so um so, I'm, so we're still on the physical fulfillment element of it so we're still uh i think we, we've literally just started sort of looking at printers and things like that um, but now that the digital edition uh, is out, there's, there's like a lot less that's specifically in my hands kind of thing, because like I'm working with a fulfillment manager, manager sorry, um, who's sort of looking at different printers and things like right now, um, just checking that, you know, the, the prices that we were expecting when we started the campaign are still there and, and things like that. So now I've got, I've got like this sort of gap where I'm like, ooh. I can start a new game. <laughs> like I can, Ooh, I can work on different things. You know, danger. <laughs> <laughs> so literally, I'm honestly, I'm I'm on holiday right now. Uh, but there is a tarot deck like laid out over there because I've been looking at this other thing. Um, well, I might work on with my partner as well, actually, who's quite excited about it. Um, but yeah, I've I've always got something happening in my head. Like I, there's nine to five. There is probably about uh, you know, like obviously you get your hours lunch break at work where you're maybe having a little thing but as soon as i clock off i'm just like always thinking about what i should be doing rather than just like maybe i should relax which is definitely a problem <laughs> but but, <laughs> but working is relaxing sometimes yeah, working yeah, is course. relaxing yeah, yeah no you, just, I, you know show your brain off and edit and things like that i got a bit of the same i mean by no mean my my own project at the moment i have this scale but uh I released a text-only edition of my game, Paris Gondo, The Life-Saving Magic of Inventoring. I just handed it to the graphic designer and I did a eight-page visual reference thing uh, for her. Mm -hmm. And so, but now I'm, I'm waiting for her to work on it and hand me stuff. And I cannot help but think about it if I'm idle. So, mm. uh, so, so I started working on the rules of my next game because I need to to work on something, and I'm kind of fed up on working. I mean, I'm love, 
I love doing the the podcast, but the editing at the moment I had, had my share of it, so I'm taking a little break uh, of that. But we're here to talk about the game, which we did not even name, I think. So what's the name of this game? Yeah, no, I think we gave it a brief mention. Uh, it is The House Doesn't Always Win, um, which is obviously a reference to sort of like casinos and gambling and that kind of thing. Uh, and that that small chance that you can you can sort of win big. Um, the reason it's framed like that is because it runs entirely using uh, a deck of playing cards. Uh, so it's got that feel of kind of like blackjack and and uh, and poker and, and those kind of casino games to them. Um, but it's very much uh, a game about sort of social change and revolutions and uprisings and shifts in power. Uh, you can see on the the front cover the the beheaded king there, which is like a um, a, a really like strong visual metaphor that was there from like even even when the game was in its infancy, like if that was uh, one of the things that we had that cover sort of like solid and ready to roll, and it it really sort of like carries the message of of uh, what happens in the game, I think, because it's a it's a setting agnostic game, so you can play, you know, you could be cowboys, knights, uh, sci-fi, cyberpunks, a- anything like that, but that central message of um, those who have very little taking on those to, uh, uh, you know, the, the big power in their world um, and sort of like just pushing their luck, luck and hoping that they can make a big change. I must say, I absolutely love the, the art and the visual identity. I'm really into this sort of stuff. And that's why I'm, I'm a bit too stressed out working with a graphic designer. I'm not a graphic <laughs> designer, but I know graphic design enough to to have yeah. a certain level of I know what I want but I, I cannot do it myself and then I need to delegate but I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible at it and uh, yeah it's it's just gorgeous and the cover and your I must say your Kickstarter page is very impressive the video it's it's simple it's minimal but really straightforward and very effective uh, Ito yeah so the the sort of um, visual identifier that we wanted to go through it because it's not set in any kind of like established world or anything like that. We can't be like, okay, well, here's what everyone's game will look like. Um, we have to have like a quite broad spectrum of, of different things that, uh, that you would see in the book. So you can see like, even just between those two images. So the ones that have been flashing up on screen are uh, the first two images that we have for the Kickstarter page. Um, and there's loads more art now. If you go onto wheelsrpgs.com forward slash THDAW or Fedor, um, you can see sort of like page previews and all that kind of thing if you're interested in watching at home. Um, but there is like a, a sort of core um, visual identity that sort of links everything together. And that's really important because we've got four artists in like throughout the book, um, as well as uh, Tom on, on the graphic design side. Um, so there's, there's like a lot of visual styles that we have to knit together and, and tie into one thing. Uh, and something that was really important for that was uh, the color palette. So you'll notice as we sort of flick through these images, um, there's like a very uh, clear sort of like limited color palette that whenever you've got that sort of inlay art, not necessarily the, the huge sort of, you know, spreads that you get a full page of art from, um, but those uh, small pops of, um, of bits of art that just sort of like sit in the text, they have like a very limited color palette. So they're all yellow, red, blue, black and white in like a certain shade and you can sort of deviate from them and give sort of gradients and all that kind of thing but they they're really boldly those colors and they they match that sort of playing card aesthetic that we've got on the front cover um and we've actually got a custom deck of cards that we're in the process of making now um which you know they they take that traditional playing card art and they sort of twist them so you can see the front cover with the beheaded king but there's also like um you know, a jack that's been captured or like a, a queen that's turncoated and is like smashing her diamond and all that kind of thing. Um, and all of the other suits, because, and we'll get into that when we talk about the game a little bit more, but, you know, the players play as the clubs, the hearts, the spades. Um, they all have their sort of classical art on the top, but then as you flip the card over, they they get sort of inverted and, and a little bit sort of twisted and a bit more like ready and on the job and that kind of thing, which is really interesting. But that, that sort of... Um, visual style just riffing on the playing cards i think it really sells like the uh the core sort of mechanics of the game just from its first look which which was something that i really wanted to uh to push so just having that sort of style of of 
uh, parlor games and, and casinos and all that kind of thing, you know, you see the logo is really like casino y. Um, I think really just sort of like immediately sells you on, oh, okay, this is a this is a playing card game. Like this isn't a game that features playing cards. This is a game about and using playing cards throughout. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing how it bleeds into the the art and it, it's it's really really well played because it's it's such an iconic identity. I mean, it's in popular culture, not popular culture as you know contemporary entertainment. It's been in the popular culture for a long time, so do everybody at least in the Western world know those cards and use them and and know those colors. So. Yeah, it's and the not only the colors but in the art, seeing the motif of elements from the mm -hmm. cards, uh, I can really see how it, it could inspire it, and it did inspire uh, artists with that. Uh, how soon in the project this this identity came to you? Was it very early as you were designing the the system or the concept, or did you did you had a, a eureka moment uh, at some point? Yeah, I think when we first. When I first started talking to Tom, so the, the first sort of like um, bit of visual identity that we had, and I can I can remember sort of like the first mock-up cover. I think originally I wanted it to be um, black and white, where the only color was sort of pops of red, where you'd have the red of the diamonds, but also of like you know blood and, and graffiti and all those kind of things. Um, and he sent it back, uh, and he had you know it was a mock cover, so it wasn't like a hundred percent. Um, like final art or anything, but he had sent back like a, a custom sort of king that he'd made that's ripping off traditional playing cards. And I was like, yeah, it's okay, but I guess the grayscale makes it look a little bit dull. Um, it's maybe a little bit sort of um, a bit too classical, maybe. Um, but when uh, we really sort of like came alive, as Tom found these, um, and they're they're open source, so it's like a, a sort of public property um, visual style of, of playing cards. And those sort of like vector graphics are available for the public to use, right? So we kind of looked at those and not only did it give us like a really solid foundation because, you know, we had some colors that we could start with to play around with and we had um, like a whole deck of cards that we could uh, twist and, and change into, into what we wanted to look like. Um, but also it meant that, you know, we, instead of just trying to sort of imitate playing cards, we were working with like the actual sort of source material, right? It was, it was like, you know, saying, uh, uh, you know, you're <laughs> you're you're trying to uh, move around different, um, you know, like imitations of something. When you're just like, why don't we just take the thing that we're actually trying to uh, use and talk about, and actually sort of like work with that? And once we got there, and and those sort of colors popped out, because I, I don't think I would have um, on my own sort of said, oh, red, yellow, and blue, that's going to be a, like our visual identifiers sort of thing. But as soon as we saw those on those playing cards, like it was just like, oh yeah, no, this is a really like beautiful, strong art style to go with and i think it really carries like the uh the visual identity like really easily on its own and it's 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 such a um strong uh image those sort of like bold colors all working together that you can almost sort of like spot a piece of house's noise win art out of context now like if you saw it on the internet having sort of like been made aware of the book you can almost be like oh that looks like it comes from theater kind of thing which i think is a really strong um, like brand, I guess, to have, which is always good when you when you want people to know about the game. Yeah, and it's it's difficult to to pin down when you you have a game, you because you you want this iconic thing, and at the same time you want something which is very fitting to your game. Uh, some games manage to do it, like I think Spire managed to do that. Uh, yeah. Sometimes people go bold, but the fans are not happy with it. I, I personally was very impressed with the V5 of Vampire the Masquerade, but there's been kind of a backlash towards that, so yeah, it's <laughs> you, you're, it's really nice that you, you found uh, your own. Uh, but since it comes from cards, I was wondering did you get how did the game start it? In did you want to do something with cards and then came up with the game? Did you had an, an idea of the type of topics you'd like to cover? Then the system with the cards came up later. What, what sort of the chain of events, if the, if such a thing can be remembered? Yeah. So um, so I remember sitting on my couch one day, uh, and I often just sort of like mess around with things when I'm thinking of ideas like I'll just I think it's really lovely to um 
Like if you're thinking of a system, you should have the object that you want people to use when you're designing that system in your hand and to be messing around with it, right? If you want to use the 20s or the sixes, have those around so that you can roll them and, and know what that feels like to, to mess around with and, and start thinking about objects in a different context. So it's like, okay, yeah, so here's, here's a, a D6. I can roll it on a table, but also, you know, I can use it as a counter and also I can, uh, I can stack them and things like that, right? Um, so I was messing around with a, with a deck of playing cards in that sort of fashion, just sort of thinking like, what can I do with this? Um, and I was like, well, what happens if you sort of, you take a deck of playing cards, but you take one of the suits out completely? Uh, so I was like, okay, well, the diamonds are quite sort of like um, ostentatious and like, you know, diamonds. It's like a very sort of uh, fancy suit in comparison to the others, which are a bit more abstract. So by taking those out, like they uh, immediately in my head, that kind of sparked that idea of like, oh, okay, they're like the ruling class almost. And they're like, they're the, um, they're the ones in power and, and the rest are kind of like the rest of the deck. They're like the 99%. Um, so that immediately that kind of started uh, sparking those ideas in my head. And um, from there, it, it kind of, you know, it's like those, one of those systems where it writes itself, where it's like, oh, okay, so if the diamonds are the ones in power, then what does that mean for the rest of them? And why are they in three different categories? So that then started to um, spur on the idea of, okay, well, maybe sort of the suits are kind of your skills. So it's like the spades are a bit more sort of backstabby and a bit more stealthy, whereas the, the clubs are very brash and aggressive or the, you know, the hearts could be quite personality driven. Um, and what I love about working with playing cards is that, you know, you, you have like a, like I was saying, like a D6, for example. And D6 is a good tool, but also it's very much a tool, right? It's, it's you know, six numbers on a cube, right? It's not very thematic, right? Um, like I can't think of, and maybe I'm just not very creative, but I can't think of many sort of uh, visual identifiers that I would go with if I, if I was making a game about D6s, right? Whereas when you're working playing cards, especially if you've got ones by a certain artist or if you've got like really classical ones, um, or especially like a tarot deck, which I'm working with right now, which is even more so, you get like a lot of theme just from, from the actual object itself. Like there's a lot of um, sort of like cultural uh, import that, that is carried by a deck of playing cards. Like you've got the connotations of, of gambling and, and the kind of games that you can play and casinos. And you think of all the things like, you know, James Bond and all those kind of stuff that like loads of um, things that have been, riffed off by playing cards already and have built that kind of established like intrinsic like law that we all have in our heads of like what playing cards are and what kind of emotions and feelings they evoke and what kind of things they sort of uh, make us think of when we see them um to the point where you know you're looking at this deck of playing cards and it, it almost like i said writes itself because you've got a lot of the um a lot of the work done for you so like I said, the diamonds, oh, okay, that's a very sort of like uh, sort of classy thing to have. So perhaps they are like that sort of higher position. Whereas clubs, for example, you know, the, just the word club sounds like a, an aggressive brash kind of like, you know, uh, melee focus, you know, all that kind of thing. Like it, it spurs ideas in your head. Um, even the, you know, the shapes can have certain things. So for example, the spades have that sort of like sharp point that got me thinking of like daggers and things like that. So Having tools like that, sorry, I think there's a Sainsbury's truck outside. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay, we cannot um, hear it. <laughs> but having those kind of um, like visual identifiers also is really useful for um, working with with game design because it, it just it just gets your mind sparking and, and just thinking about things in a different context. And um, and whilst you might want to take those ideas and then subvert them sometimes, also you can put yourself in a position where you're like, oh, actually, no, I love the you know, someone sees the, the heart suit and if they're like, I want to um, persuade this person, they can probably make that link in their head. Like if I want to make like a social action, then heart, you know, is the kind of empathetic, uh, manipulating maybe like sort of uh, tool that I can use. So it's it's also a really good thing for, for teaching and accessibility because it's it, it gives that sort of textless idea of what you're using. Uh, straight from just looking at the thing which is is super useful uh, i mean in general i love also both as a game master and now as a game designer i love when you put yourself in the middle of um i guess a culture maybe a, i don't know what it's called but like a section of the culture 
and you you get a little idea you put it in the middle and then you explore what's already there and yet yeah, it, it prompts ideas um i'm doing something revolving around monks at the moment and each time i find something yeah it prompts an idea you got numerology when it relates to, to christianity uh a game uh, i love people take a drink uh, nephilim is all about those symbols and they, they're loaded with meanings which people don't realize but maybe they do as subtext you're not quite sure and when you look into that you look everywhere uh, i assume maybe you, you had that when you get interested uh, into something like the symbols of playing cards especially tarot decks uh, suddenly you walk around the city and you start noticing that those symbols are here and there not in a conspiracy fashion but it's just they depart the part of, a, of the culture in a very subdued fashion that they keep yeah, popping absolutely. up. Yeah, we, we do have like a sort of um, uh, shared kind of like cultural visual language that we don't necessarily think about all the time. Like there's, um, you know, I was, we were just talking about the tarot decks. Like there's, uh, there's so much um, in there. Like, you know, like a card isn't just uh, the seven of clubs. It's, the devil or it's like the four of swords or something or like the the eight of pentacles or something so you get like a really really thematic um sort of push from from every card that you're drawing because a lot of uh, a lot of the games that use playing cards that i've played and that i've seen around are usually as like a, a sort of they, they almost take the place of like a, a randomization table because you've got 52 cards so if you imagine those as prompts you would have kind of like 13 down down the uh the sort of vertical side and then four on the top and you would maybe roll a d4 against a d13 or whatever and sort of find your point on the table but you can make that a lot more um easy and and uh fluid by just drawing a card out of a deck right so i think a lot of the time um those usually sit as like prompts so i see it a lot in journaling games uh so things like uh for example the machine or gentleman bandit things like that where it's like you're writing something and then you know you don't have a gm you're maybe playing solo or it's like a storytelling game that you're playing with friends you draw a card and it tells you that something happens and you try and fill in the blanks right um when you're playing with something like a tarot deck like you know i was i was writing kind of uh ideas and prompts and things that were that were linked to these cards and, and suddenly it's not just like oh what you know here's Here's diamonds, which I guess will be about finding treasure, or here's hearts, which I guess will be about finding people. Instead, it's, you know, you've got 22 of these sort of like major arcana cards, they're called, where they have this, like, not only do they have like a fully visualized, like, depiction of a scene on them. So, for example, I'll grab this one. This is one of my favorite ones from this deck. This is a deck by Michael Ulrich. It like this is the devil. Like, look at that. Look how much <laughs> there is to work with on that thing. Like, there's like it's a it's a very sort of like um paganist that you've got like the sort of like ram skull and the the pentacle and the hooves and all that kind of thing there's like little i'm not sure if you can see them but little servants down on the bottom so like immediately if you're trying to like tell a story or, or think of something interesting for your characters to happen like you've got those visuals there and those visuals will also be completely different based on which deck you're using which is really cool to start with but even just like it's the devil. It's card number um, 25 or 15, rather. Like it's, you know, you're, you've got like the Roman numerals and all that kind of thing. So having these like really beautiful pieces of art in your hand when you're when you're trying to work things out is like a really, really useful tool for people. And it takes a lot of the um, a lot of the onus off the player to be like completely creative because um, it means that they have things to riff off. So like having that as a as a building block for building a game, and like if you're if you're listening to this and thinking about designing your first game, um, a lot of people will go with dice because you know they're used to things like uh, Dungeons and Dragons or or maybe like Forged in the Dark or or uh, Powered by the Apocalypse or anything like that, which are all dice based systems. Um, but like the mechanics in those systems are quite abstract. Uh, whereas when you start working with other tools, like okay, you know there's a um, there's a, a solo RPG that was recently kickstarted as part of Zine Quest, um, which is called Lay on Hands. And it's a, uh, it's a journaling game where you're playing as like this post-apocalyptic like healer slash messiah figure. 
Um, but instead of doing conflict resolution by drawing a card or rolling dice or what have you, you spin a coin um, and then you have until that coin stops spinning to do like a small dexterity task. Um, <laughs> and then when where that coin lands on a table will also give you more prompts. And that immediately, because that mechanic is like way different from just like generating a number or drawing a prompt, um, immediately it, it conveys like a message onto the player of like, oh, okay, like there's pressure. Like this is this is a thing, one in which I can fail as a character, but also physically fail. There's also dexterity involved. Like I can have a physical skill. So that that has a lot more of a message to the player of like what to expect from the story that they're telling and what to expect from like how the game works and interacts with the narrative. So with um, House Doesn't Always Win, like this is a game about, you know, pushing your luck and, and going up against people who are far stronger than you. You know, they outman you, they outgun you, they outnumber you, they've got all of the advantages. Um, but you just have this sort of hunch that and this desire and drive that if you can push hard enough, you might just be able to flip the odds just a little bit and give yourself that one window of opportunity. Um, so it's a game about sort of like, you know, trying to not like read cards, but trying to intuit sort of, okay, how many diamonds are left in like in that display? Like, should we get some more? How many spades are left in the deck now that we've drawn quite a few? Do I have a better chance or a worse chance? You know, I'm about to draw a card that could either kill a character or win us the game. Do I have the stomach for it? You know, and you like know, a... you know, you get this tension of, yeah, uh, because it's what I find fascinating is you you talk about uh, the aspect of the cards, which is the interpretation of the cards, which which is very tarot like, and uh, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, it makes me think of. Uh, board games also well although uh, that's another question but the the limit between story games board games and role playing games at the moment there are a lot of things happening in that blurry space but uh, mm. th there's the other aspect of the playing cards which is the uh, for lack of a better word mathematical or mechanical side of it which is if you have a deck of cards from which you pick cards unlike a dice you don't only have a I don't know a, a chance to pick something between two numbers uh, on a spectrum, but you know th there's this certainty that there will be bad cards and there will be good cards unless yeah. you reshuffle your cards, which is usually part of the mechanic. And there are a lot of systems which completely dismiss the the interpretation of or I quote classic playing cards to just use that bit. And uh, it's fascinating that you're you're using both. Yeah, so um, one thing that I find really interesting uh, about using playing cards is, is to, as a sort of like resolution mechanic. So, you know, in your classic, you know, just to use D&D as an example, because everyone knows it, right? You get given a difficulty number that you need to hit. You either know it or you don't. Um, and then you roll a die, you add your modifier, and you either succeed or you fail based on just whether or not you hit that number, right? And you've always got the exact same odds um of rolling that number and in the exact same way as long as that difficulty number doesn't change and as long as your modifier doesn't change so if you need to get a 15 to win um then you've always got a 75 percent chance of failing or whatever it is right um whereas when you're playing with playing cards as you said like the odds change every single time you draw a card and what's interesting about the house doesn't always win is that instead of the players sort of like having hand of cards or anything like that they're all sharing this deck that sits in the middle of the table and it's called the opportunity deck because it's kind of like a an abstract representation of how much of a chance you have left on your mission to to do what you came to do, which in this case is to try and take down like a, a key figure in the diamonds. Um, so as you mess around with that um, that deck and as you as you do resolutions and challenges, as you sort of discard things and as you fail, you remove cards from the deck for the rest of the session. The odds are constantly changing and and sort of slipping out of favor and things like that and there's that idea of you know like if you need to do things with the heart card for example if i need to draw hearts to, to succeed at something but you've already drawn like five out of the you know um 13 that are remaining um and you know that those are in those uh, in the in the discard pile sorry like there's not only the um mathematical sort of like game uh question of like oh like what does that mean for my odds uh you know how much does that change the situation it also tells the story in itself because like if you're physically finding it harder to 
to use your social skills and deduction and things like that. What does that say about the situation that you're in narratively? Like if you physically are, um, you know, spending hearts all the time or just happen to be getting rid of them, you know, maybe like people are starting to become a bit more suspicious of you or, um, you know, maybe your uh, social status has kind of dropped a little bit since you started the, the mission, especially if those cards are physically being removed from the deck, because that means that, you know, if you've got a character who is all about sort of social stealth and persuasion, things like that, but because of bad luck or just because, you know, of some careless play, they've lost like most of the hearts from the deck for the rest of the mission, then they're going to have to rethink what their character is going to do now and, and like how their character is going to act. Um, so the, you know, the, the physical makeup of the deck is like a really interesting um, way of, of shifting that idea of like, I will always have a one in six chance of doing this because I am good at that. Or I will always have a one in 10 chance of doing that because I'm not as good. Instead, it's you've got improved odds, but those odds are a bit more sort of like abstract and a bit more difficult to, to physically know, which I think does two things that are really important for for my sake. Like the not only does it remove some of the maths um, from RPGs, because it, it's unless you are physically like, you know, a card counter unless you are that scene in the hangover where he's just like watching everything go and numbers are flying across his face. Like you, you aren't going to know the exact odds of, of drawing the card that you need at the time you need them. But you always have that kind of idea. Like you've seen a lot of spades go. So if you're looking for spades, you're like, this is probably going to be more difficult. Um, and, you know, you've done challenges before and you've been like, okay, well, it's quite tricky to get three, but two wasn't quite as hard. So you've got that sort of like intuition which is a lot more natural and a lot more interesting, I think, than just doing a maths equation. Or especially if, like me, you're not maybe that good at maths, but you don't have to sort of like sit there and go, oh, okay, let me work this out. All right, so how, how likely am I to get this? Um, so I think one of the, uh, the things for me is like, you know, just sort of removing the barrier between the player and what's happening in the story in a way that isn't just let's get rid of game elements, but let's change game elements, sorry, into a way that, or into a medium that sort of encourages people to be as excited about the draw they're doing as they are about what the repercussions of that event are. So one of my favorite memories from sort of like playtesting this was, you know, we had, um, we had this like situation where I think one of the characters was facing off against one of their targets. So they're like the sort of, you know, the actual mission is to, is to take them down, right? So if you're attempting a challenge against them, it's like win or lose status. Um, and they, they'd gotten to a point where like, you know, the spread that they'd gotten, they just had really bad draws to start with. Um, and they were literally on the case of uh, either drawing a card and completely failing and possibly even damaging their own character and possibly even someone else's, I think, or, you know, just sitting in it but then they noticed that the, the deck had gotten really slim because you know all the aces have gone so all the reshuffles have gone so they were in a position where they they had like a hunch they were like the, this deck is really small so like my crit card my character card and i'll talk about those in a second but basically if you draw a pitch card like a jack queen or king in the right suit it's a crit so they were like my card is is in there and i'm pretty sure there's only like five cards left so <laughs> <laughs> they were in a position where they were like i've got a hunt i know that this could risk the entire mission but i've just got this hunch and everyone was like do not draw that card it's so stupid don't do that but then they were just like nope it's my challenge they flipped the card and like drew their own card um drew their own character's card which is not just a critical success but what is affectionately known in the book as a mega crit um and like the the whole room just sort of like erupted in cheer like it was like oh my god which like i've never really had playing an rpg before like there's always been moments where it's like oh i got a crit amazing but it's never been like you know you've never really understood the weight of the um you know not the equation of the maths behind it but the weight of it like the oh my god like the odds of that happening were really low um, and it doesn't matter what the number was like i could feel them when i was playing um and the fact that that deck, deck is static, like it, it just not only encourages that idea and, and sort of pushes people to, to think more about like their relationship with the stakes that they still have in the world. But one of my, one of my favorite things about it as well is, you know, um, there's a mechanic in the game called folding. So if you are halfway through a challenge and it looks like things are going to go bad, what you can do is you can just sort of like drop out. 
and you have a, a chance of losing cards, but you do, you're not guaranteed to. And most importantly, those character cards, the Jack, Queens and Kings, which represent your characters around the table, they're always safe in the event of a fold. So you can, you can stop people getting hurt by folding. Um, but when you fold, like, you're not just like, well, I guess we'll never know. Because, you know, the next person to draw cards knows exactly what would have happened had they drawn that card. So sometimes <laughs> you'll do a challenge, you'll fold, and you're like, no, it's too rich, like, it's not worth it. And then the next challenge, you'll draw, like, a critical success uh, card if you had drawn it. And you'll be like, oh, no, so why did it's, you do that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not like not rolling a dice. And you, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You never know what the dice would roll. You, you know, you can have the result mm. because it's in the sequence. Which you ignore. Yeah, yeah, which I I love that. I you know I I love the drama of it around the table. And considering like the, um, I like I'm I'm always a, a big uh, evangelist of games that, you know, aren't just like here's a set of mechanics and here's the world. Like the the world and the mechanics are so intrinsically linked to each other, like they couldn't be separated. Like the the house doesn't always win. Um, like I've got uh. A, a page on my website which is uh, members of the house so if you search for that in the style of forge in the dark or powered by the apocalypse like if you want to make a game using those systems like you're more than welcome give me an email and i can i can you know officially license it and give you a logo and all that kind of stuff um but more importantly like i, I think that um that necessarily won't be quite as uh, a far-flung success as something like powered by the apocalypse because you know it has like a really important link to the type of story that the house has noise when tells and it's not about the the setting that it's in but it's like the um the kind of genre like the the idea of you know your characters are in the most dangerous situations of their entire lives but there is so much at stake that they have to push past that and push their luck and hope for the best and, and be bold um and that's exactly what the game asks you to do when you're playing it as well. Like if you stripped all of the story out of it, you'd still feel that, right? You'd still feel that sort of gamble, that sort of, oh, do we want to do this? Do I want to push? Like, you know, have I got the guts to do this kind of thing? And there's a, a lot of tension both in the mechanics and in the narrative. And I, I think that's a really important thing for me, just like having that, um, that intrinsic link between how it feels to play and how your characters feel, because that just sort of breaks down so many barriers between your players and the world that they're in. Um, which I think is really important for for role playing games, especially because you know you're you're playing characters, right? So you you've got to um, you've got to have a mechanical aid for that as much as a as a story one, I think. Um, which you know is is something that I feel like, but you know, feel free to correct me if you're if you're listening to this and you don't think that after reading the book. I feel like is is something that is a real strength for the house's noise when like it, it. I think it really puts you in the in the shoes of the characters because you're not just telling a story about them and then rolling dice, you are living what they're living as well. Yeah, I like when you, you describe the, the hunch thing because that's, that's a trope you see in uh, heroic stories of the, you know, in movies, you got a character, they, they end up in a bad situation, but uh, they got a hunch that things will go better. Be and like, I've got this picture of someone being a prisoner, they they attach and so on and they're on top of a skyscraper and they just throw themselves in the void because they mm. got a hunch that their friends are there and they gotta pick them up like I don't know fast and furious style and yeah and of course they do because those stories they are not randomized they, they're written but the concept of the cart also leads me to to remember something from a, an episode I really liked of the Misdirected Mark podcast, uh, which was called uh, "Laying Down," uh, let's lay down the beat. It, it was a, a, about Robin D. Lowe's and the concept of in your games you should recognize beats, so you can have upbeats when you succeed at something, or downbeats. And if you have a sequence of upbeats, well, you become numb to it you you don't even mm. realize you succeed at things and on the opposite if you have don't beat don't beat don't beat which i had at a camping w with people who they, they love playing this way so it's it's fine for them but it wasn't fine for me they, they're having fun so they're doing it right for themselves but not for me <laughs> and it was don't beat don't beat don't beat don't beat i was like i cannot uh, i cannot take that anymore but <laughs> i'm gonna cry <laughs> but, yeah it's like i'm supposed to play a badass fbi agent so if if i'm mm. failing miserably at everything it, it's really not worth it for me in my views but with the deck of cards you you have those beats being, and even with the colors, because you got the up down beat, but you got a, an investigative beat, a social beat, a action beat. 
as you say, rather than always relying on the same crutch, uh, the cards make it so that, oh, you've been very social lately, so people are getting suspicious now, so maybe it's, yeah. it's time to punch someone in the face or do something like that. <laughs> but yeah, it's there mechanically, so no one, to some extent, they, they might have a very rough start of a session, but then they, they know that they will have this heroic moment, they will be tied to a chair, like uh, the the Black Widow in Avengers, but th th that's a moment when well, actually I was faking it, and now I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna blast everything uh, uh, around me. So yeah, it's a mechanical way to enforce uh, curves uh, and the rhythm of the beat uh, of what is going on, a diversity of experience rather than uh, okay, fifty percent chances, fifty percent chances, fifty percent chances. Yeah, I've been failing ten fifty percent chances in a row. <laughs> It's not working for me tonight. No, at least if you fail in a row, they, there are good cards there. <laughs> they should be there. They Maybe yeah. they're all at the back of the deck, but they are there. Yeah, so like one, one of the things that is really interesting about um, specifically the way that, that Theodore uses cards as well, uh, it kind of, you know, to, to further that point that you made, um, the, uh, the way in which like a spread um, gets drawn so when you're starting a challenge, here's, here's how a challenge works. For, someone, for anyone who doesn't know how the house is noise works, wins work, sorry, or hasn't read about it or anything like that, um, you are going to draw cards from the top of the deck until you either succeed, fail, or fold. So if you're trying to do an action, you choose a suit um, that matches that action. And you can use any suit technically for any action, but obviously, you know, Things are going to be more difficult in one suit than they are in another, and it all depends on you know how appropriate that that choice is for you. So let's say that you're a really hitty character, um, and you're trying to like uh, uh, you know jump through a window and tackle someone onto the ground to to stop them fleeing, right? Um, so that's like you know it's a difficult action. It takes a, a few sort of like uh, cards revealed to to work. So the GM sets a, a difficulty number, you apply your modifiers, and let's say that you've ended up with like three, right? So I need you to draw three club cards to succeed. That's, that's basically the, um, the task that you have. And you will fail if you draw four non-club cards before you can do that. So if you draw two hearts and two spades uh, and one club, but you, know, you draw that, that final card that doesn't match a club, that's a fail. If you draw three clubs and you know two hearts, then you're absolutely fine. And you'll make that equation every time you draw a card, right? So the first card you draw, it's a heart, not great, but then you get a club, but then you get a spade. And that's where, um, like you said, like with tarot cards, you get that kind of reading of the action. So one thing that um, I think is really interesting for, uh, for the way that the challenges work and how it's always win, instead of it just being like a binary or, or trinary is that a word <laughs> <laughs> when you've got like a, a yes no or a yes no and maybe um which is kind of how a lot of rpgs work where it's like in dnd it's yes or no right you either succeed or you fail empowered by the apocalypse you either get a fail you get a partial success or you get a success and that basically is the same thing but one comes with a complication um but in the house doesn't always win you've got states so you've got yeah okay you failed yeah okay you succeeded or you might have pulled out if you folded. Um, but you've also got like this whole spectrum in between them, which is kind of implied by the cards that you drew. So if you were asked to draw those three clubs and immediately you draw three clubs in a row, that was a very like successfully done task, right? You have completely knocked it out of the park. There were no complications whatsoever. But if you drew like three spades before you drew a single club, but push through, that suddenly someone struggling but then pushing through and making it in the end right if you fail your task um and you happen to draw like one of the clubs that you needed but then everything else was a was a mess you know you barely got where you needed to to go before things started falling apart but if you drew two clubs in a row and then loads of failed cards like you were so close right you were so close to getting there and then it all fell apart so like that's not just a fail that is a tool for the GM and the and the player to think, okay, well, what does that look like in the world? Like that is like um, a visual and you know slightly mathematical equation that that they can do in their head where they're like, oh no, like this wasn't just a fail. Like you really like something really bad happened, or this wasn't just a success. Like you just scraped past, or you did really well. 
Um, and the, the thing that's the most interesting with that is the, the folding mechanics. So when you fold, um, it's not really a success or a fail. Like it's, you don't get what you want. Like the book states that like when you, when you fold, you don't get what you're after because if you wanted that, you had to push through. Um, but you know, you can see from the spread that you've got, if you folded, but you were like two thirds of the way to a success, that's very different than if you folded after just one card and you're like, nope, no, no, no. You know, if you just drew one card and you're like, nope, that's bad. Then, you know, you pull out and you're just like, you know, you're not really, uh, committing yourself whereas if you were like 90 percent of the way to an action and then pull out like let's say that you're trying to persuade uh like a guard to let you in the back entrance with a bribe or something right you know surely if if you drew one card and then folded that's you just going like you're walking up to the guard and then like you know you you've actually just with your tail between your legs just walked away again before they've noticed you Whereas if you've gone up you've, and like five cards have been drawn and you were like 90% of the way there, but then you just got too many failed cards and you were just a little bit too close to failure. That is you like having a full conversation with them and, and being like, you know, hinting at something. And then you're just about to say like, you know, show them the coin that you're about to bribe them with. And at that point you pull out, that's a very different situation that the player is now in. Like that guard is aware of what you were doing and, and why you're here and, you know, they are possibly maybe a lot more suspicious of you and things like that. So using those cards to, to sort of like tell a micro story every time you're doing an action, um, is, it's got a lot in common with those kind of like journaling games where you're like, you're drawing prompts every turn. But instead of it being, here's a prompt, to fill in the blank, it's like, here's like four or five moments that happened as you were doing this action. So you weren't just jumping through a window and tackling the target. Here's the moment where, you know, you, you sort of got on your haunches and ready to sprint. Then you sped off and you got a good clip, but suddenly, you know, you had like a, a change of heart and you're like, God, I'm about to jump through glass. And maybe you faltered a bit, which slowed you down, but then you leap through and you, you put your elbows up and smash through that glass. And then that last card is you just sort of like getting your angles perfect and just grabbing onto them and pulling them down to the ground. And you can see all those things happen when you draw those cards, because like, you know, it's not just oh, here's, um, you know, here's like a, a, a success or a fail, but here's five of them mix and match. Um, it's, oh, okay, you know, you drew the club that you needed, but then you drew a spade. So what does that mean? Like, did you try and sort of like be a little bit more fleet-footed than you were expecting when you probably should have gone for power? If you drew a heart, like, did you overthink yourself? Like, there's, there's so many different miniature prompts that you can pull on, or you can just completely ignore if you like, and it won't change a thing. Um, you know, you, you can still just run the system as like a, a binary sort of like, okay, you failed, it succeeded. But all that information is there and ready to use for either the player or the GM to tell a more interesting story with everything that they're doing. I find it, it's so fascinating because not only you are saying it's, uh, there's the, the aspect that it's not binary, success versus failure, or even success, uh, success with a complication and, and failure, but it's the way it develops into time because a typical combat if you want to reproduce an experience you see on screen i was talking on twitter about what once upon a time in china we've got those beautiful wuxia uh shaolin kung fu style uh combat well if you play most role-playing games it's okay my round i hit oh i kick he hits he dives and so on and it's it's mm -hmm. really clunky so you multiply the action and you still have the, this repetition of the binary and the closest thing to making that still work for me it was not combat but uh it was for intrigue in uh, a song of ice and fire where you had those different moves and so you had a scene and you you had different posture about what you were trying to achieve in that scene with that individual and uh, okay i'm trying to charm them what i want is the information but i start by charming them and i move through intimidation and so on but it's still kind of heavy but coming back to the idea of the the combat or the social action yeah with the card and as i can imagine that you could ignore that if you are short for time but if you want each card you you can describe and explain what what is going on okay you pull this one or you are engaged in that fight or actually you you manage to to punch them okay then next card it's a sort of failure okay they they grab a bunch of sand and they threw it in your your eyes you can make it very very fluffy and in individual without being 
clunky, fluffy without the crunk. So it's it's quite it's quite fascinating and a, and a feat, yeah. Yeah. So I the um so I, I think I ended up playing this whilst I was like halfway through development already. So it was less of like oh I like that I'll riff on it and more like a yeah this is the kind of thing I'm working towards. Um, but I played Aegon by by John Harper, which is a, a game about sort of like Greek myths and like demigods and, and you know, uh, going from island to island and, and doing sort of like great feats and stuff. And when you do actions in in Aegon, like everyone rolls together that's part of it. Um, and you you get the results first and then you say what happens. So rather than it being like in Dungeons and Dragons where you say, OK, I want to stab this guy with my sword. But then you roll like a two and you're like, oh, OK, it bounces off his armor or like, you know, here's the cool thing that you wanted to happen. Now you you don't get that. Sorry, here's here's like something stupid that happened instead, right? And there's ways where you, you know you've got if you've got a good GM, you'll be like, oh, he he sidesteps and and parries you because you know he's a really good fighter. Um, you know, try and not make the hero feel like an but, idiot. And but at the same time, like, without mechanics are doing that. Yeah, you know? without the prompt, it's it's exhausting. I try to do that as yeah. a game master and a player. It becomes very exhausting when you just have okay failure or success failure, and you're like, oh, or even a complication, and you're like. Ah, uh, I ended up with so many swords sticked in a wall <laughs> because at yeah. some point I'm like, it's like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try and verbalize the exact same information in 400 different ways, like in one night. Like that is a big thing for a GM, right? That is, like you say, it, it's tiring. Um, whereas uh, in Aegon, so um, the way it works is everyone rolls their dice and they're all trying to hit one target number. Um, and you either have, uh, for example, um, you know, like you, you, it is just binary, right? So you succeed or you fail. Um, you either have someone who manages to to get the number above, or you get someone who manages to um, sort of like not only get it above, but be the person who succeeded the best. So basically rolled the highest. And then you have anyone who didn't roll below it. So you start with all the people that failed, and then you move up to the people that succeeded, and then you end with the person who succeeded the most. And they, they do like, you know, the killing blow or the last word or whatever it is. So let's say that you're fighting like a giant monster. Uh, the first person who failed like sort of dives in and, and tries to swipe with the sword. But, you know, the and this, you know, this is the player doing this. This isn't the GM because they already know the results. So they know what happens to their character. They're just verbalizing it. So they're like, oh, I tried to go with my sword, but like the the hide of the of the creature is, is too strong. So my my blade just sort of like slides off it like leather. Um and then somebody else comes in and, and says, oh, okay, so I see you struggling and go over with my shield to protect you. And because I'm so busy doing that, I can't get involved with the combat too much. Whereas then you start getting into the successful people. So they're like, all right, I know that this guy is coming up next and he's the one with the killing blow. So I'm going to set him up rather than try and be like, oh, I like, you know, slice his throat or whatever. You know, they're going to go, uh, okay, I jump on the back of the creature and grab it by the horns and expose its weak point. And then that, readies the the person to finish off to be like and then i leap up and you know stab it in the chest and and it, it, it falls over or whatever so you've got that idea of like okay we've done the resolution now let's tell the story which is a lot more interesting a lot more intuitive and allows the players to be a lot more involved in in like the narrative of it um because instead of just sort of like here's what i want to happen does it happen or not it's like here's what happened now make sense of that and I love that. I, I think that's a much better way of doing that kind of system. But what I like about Theodore is that you kind of get the best of both worlds. Because when you're drawing cards from the House of Noise Win, you are not sort of like, you don't already know the result. So you're like, here's the thing that I want to do. And then I'm going to draw. And like, you will get the idea of like, you either did or you didn't or you folded. But you know where things are going as you're drawing those cards. So like you can read the room almost like you can feel like, okay, this isn't going the way that I expected it. So it's not just like a roll of dice. No, it's like, you know, you're, you're drawing cards and then you're like, oh, this feels like it's going to go wrong. And <laughs> you feel you yourself slipping. So it's, it's... Exactly. Yeah. And you have the choice then of being like, this is going to fail. Should I fold or should I keep going, uh, you know, and push my luck. And, you know, if, if you then get that failure, that's your decision. Right. So like if you keep drawing and, and hitting that four number, it's not a case of like, oh, if you draw one card and it happens to be the bad card, then you fail. It's a case of if you keep drawing and you know that the next card could be a failure, but you decide to, 
then that feels a lot less crappy than oh I just I rolled a one because I did like it just happened so I didn't didn't have any control over it um but also you can like you said you can feel it slipping right you can you can feel how well things are going you can have those moments where you feel like you're in control but then you keep drawing cards you're like oh this is falling away from me like I don't know if I should be here anymore so you've got that idea of like you're telling that story of you know you know what's happening but you don't know exactly what's happened so you still get all the tension of like did the thing happen but without just sort of like a yes or a no answer more of like a okay you know what do you reckon you here's here's some like you know you you're looking a little bit sure-footed you've you've got your shields uh held high you're feeling strong you're getting a few glancing blows he's looking like he's on his knees but then he gets up he starts pushing back like you know you've got like a uh, a sort of clash of blades and you're maybe looking at each other eye to eye as the swords are touching and you know that one one wrong movement could could be disaster and you can feel that whenever you're drawing the cards because that is exactly how that system works like it's every step is a is a step towards either or you know you're like uh you're 30 percent of the way to success but you're 60 percent of the way to failure and it's like do I stick it or do I pull out and, and sort of rescind my, my movement? It's, it's, it's like a, it's a system where you're telling the story as it's happening rather than just be like, here's what I want to happen. Please, Mr. Dice God. <laughs> yeah. yeah but that's the thing which is frustrating. I find with, uh, I mean, I, I, I was brought up on traditional games and I think there's much merit with them, but there's sort of this, I like to describe stuff. And in traditional game, the, the the moment you have as a player to shine in your description is when you describe what you are attempting to do, and yeah. and the result of a dice, if you have a success, most of the time, you know, the culture of game mastering is when you succeed, you 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 get to describe a bit more uh, what you've done, so you're rewarded with that. You got a success, plus you're rewarded with a little bit of description. But uh, yeah, when you spend time saying, okay, I lean and I swing my sword this way and uh, at the same time I do this thing and then you just fail. Uh, pardon my French, but it's, it's just like a cock block. Like it's, it's just, okay, and it's over now. You've got nothing to describe. And, mm. you know, that's my issue with a lot of rules. So like, for instance, a game which I haven't played directly, but I played a lot of game inspired by is Cthulhu Dark. And the con one of the concept from it, from what I've heard <laughs> indirectly by playing game inspired by it, is that when you are confronted by stress, so that would be the the equivalent, the replacement for the the sanity system in Call of Tulu, uh, when you are confronted by stress, you can describe a flashback involving a person you knew, which is your anchor, and so failing is an opportunity for you to describe something going on with your life and in your mm. character while playing Call of Cthulhu is, oh, you roll a sanity test. Okay, uh, either it's a success and nothing happens or it's a failure and you're losing agency. The game master is just going to take your character and tell you, okay, your character is going to behave like that now for, for five five minutes to ten hours. And Mm. It's just frustrating, but here, here it's uh, you could revel. Uh, sometimes I can revel really in failure if I've got the opportunity of, of telling what it looks like at the player mm. as a player. Uh, how much time do you have? Because we we're just about to mark the one hour. Uh, do you want to end here, or do you want to discuss a, a bit more? Uh, should we go for another half hour? Okay, cool. I, I just wanted to ask you because you're using playing cards. Uh, my own games got cards which you fill and, and pass over index cards and I find it's quite fascinating as someone who works uh, for Dicebreaker and you're quite aware of what is going on on the scene uh, not only role playing games but uh, also quite a bit board games I, I find it fascinating what is going on in that space between the two uh, I interviewed uh, Peter Petrusha who's been doing Rest in Pieces which uses a Jenga tower of course there was Dread and Starcross, which did yeah. that before, but but I find there's more and more of those games which kind of bridge the gap between uh, were werewolves, Lugaru uh, Tierselu, or Dixit, and sort of story games. Uh, yeah, what, what? Or do you find your own game sitting into that? Uh, do Do you find this space could become maybe not its own thing, but something recognizable, both by role players who would be interested into it and maybe by 
uh, I guess party gamers, board gamers, they often use story games as well. I, I don't know. I find it, you know, trying to sell my own game, I keep wondering, okay, could this actually interest people? This this sort of, you got a lot of things on the table, you pass around and so on. Could this interest uh, an audience which is different than the, the dice rollers of uh, D&D, Call of Tulu and uh, Traveler and all or, or classic games? Yeah, so I think this is this is actually something that like I I want to see more of. Like this isn't just like a, a thing that I've noticed. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. This is something that I'm like evangelizing every step I can take, right? So like whenever people are um inventing new systems and things like that, like I'm always asking the question of like, you know, have you played this board game, for example? Like, have you have you tried this? Like, because this really reminds me of that and the reason i'm always asking those questions is because like i think that rpgs as a space um have, have gradually drifted apart from sort of like the rest of tabletop uh and i don't think that's you know i think that's kind of slightly to the detriment of them because i think there are some incredible things that happen in other tabletop spaces like miniatures games and board games and like you said party games things like that that have invented these really interesting mechanical ways to, um, to to interact with other people and to to tell stories and to and to you know like envision how you might uh, exist in in certain worlds, right? You know, like there there is a board game where you can be pretty much anything in the world, right? You can be a doctor or a trader or a spaceman or you know whatever you want. Um, and if you're writing an RPG, like you, know, you know, let's take Spaceman for example, right? If you're writing an RPG and you're um, you want the characters to be playing sort of like you know 1960s space race characters, for example, who are who are going up in the one of the first sort of like shuttle launches. Um, you could just say, "Cool, I'm going to make it a Power by the Apocalypse game," which you know, cue me sort of like tearing my hair out in the background. But like, there's <laughs> there's such a space for you then to think of, um, you know, why. If you're playing this character specifically, and it doesn't have to be a spaceman, it could be whatever you like, but if you're if you're playing, I don't know why I keep saying spaceman, by the way, astronaut is probably the better word. Um, but like if you're um playing as this specific character, the specific role, um, why do you use the same sort of like mechanics and resolution system and everything else that you would use in games where you are a knight who's stabbing people, or you would use in a game where you know you're an investigator looking into sort of like eldritch beings and things like that why do they all use the same mechanics um and you know like ask yourself that question and think what's a better way of of like embodying these people through game game design because a lot of the time there's you know you see a lot of in rpgs there's kind of a split there are ones that go down really mechanical and sort of like mathematical ideas of okay well here's like 400 roll tables and you've got all kinds of stats and they're based off that kind of like old like miniatures style design where it's like tactical combat of like people moving around in spaces and using abilities and rolling off against like you know it's, it's like playing warhammer right it's like uh here's my stat i roll off against your stat did i get damage all that kind of thing and then outside of that they try and mirror that with their um social elements as well so for example you know the way in which you stab someone and the way in which you convince someone is is exactly the same in games like warhammer and and D, &D and all that kind of thing whereas like you know should they be and especially if this is a brand new system and it's a brand new game and it's a brand new world should you be using the same mechanics for that um and i think one way that the uh, designers, if they want to, can get out of that is by looking at how board games do things. Because, you know, for example, let's say the, um, let's compare like systems to mechanics and games. So say like Forged in the Dark, right? Forged in the Dark comes from Blades in the Dark. It's a game about being rogues and being sneaky. And, um, you know, it's all about like gangs and like rising tension and all that kind of thing. You can see that in the mechanics. Like that's a game where the mechanics um, back up the narrative that you're playing in. And the more that you iterate on that system and make more forged in the dark games about different settings and stuff like that, you do end up sort of losing that kind of relationship between the world and the, and the mechanics a little bit. Um, whereas with, you know, board games, like let's take another like mechanic, like worker placement or like social deduction. There's like a thousand different hidden role social deduction games that were like 
uh, inspired by things like Werewolf, but are just completely different. Like there are things like Two Rooms and a Boom, for example, where the you know the sort of general idea of the game is there's a blue team and a red team. Each team has like a leader and like an assassin. And if you end the game with your assassin in the same room as the leader of the opposite team, then your team wins. And you you literally go between rooms each turn, sort of like sending hostages back and forth and stuff like that. But the way that that works is not just, oh, okay, you know, just like Werewolf, we stand in a circle, someone does something, and then we debate. You know, it's two debates going on. Everyone's got different roles and they're like showing each other bits of their card. It's like, hey, look, I'm on the red team. So like the game knows that that's how that works and they play you to it. So it's, you know, one of the um, most basic cards you can have in the game is because it's a pretty standard thing to show someone the top of your card to say, hey, I'm on the red team too. You have a spy card, which looks red, but actually is a blue card, right? So you've got things like that where you play with the mechanics in a way that, oh, that makes perfect sense that they, you know, they're like pretending to be someone else. So they have the credentials that they can show to someone in the real world. Um, and I think that's such a like interesting thing for like a role playing game. Like imagine that in like a storytelling role playing role playing game situation where you've got those hidden roles and those things like that. There was a I can't for the life of me remember the, the name of the game, and I should really look it up because I keep referencing it. Um, but there's like a, a, a game that won an Emmy uh, last year, which is all about sort of that zombie apocalypse vibe. And it takes something that I've seen in board games quite a lot, where you have a deck of cards, one of them has like a bite symbol on it and the and the others are blank so every time you get bit by a zombie you secretly look at a card that you've drawn from the deck and then place it underneath you and you might have gotten bit right but you don't want anyone else around the table to know and it's not just a case of like oh my character's been bit so he's not going to tell you all it's a case of like they physically don't know because you've drawn from that card and there's a physical mechanical way that the game tells you and al allows you to experience that moment of like you look at the card and suddenly it's not just can your character keep their call it's like can you you've just seen the bike <laughs> symbol and you're like you know you don't want anyone to know right so it's like there's there's so many ways in which um you know board games are already doing this kind of like really interesting exploration of what does it mean to be this kind of person what does it mean to be in this situation um you know what are the differences between uh being like you know the classic is like being a, a merchant in ancient rome or whatever like you know there's 400 board games where you can do that but you know suddenly what is how does that change if if you're all uh, uh you know like space aliens with different needs and stuff so there's like a game called sidereal confluence i think it's called where everyone is playing their own character around the table that you know creates certain things that other people need right so you've all got your own different uh like engine that you need to power and everyone around you has all the stuff that you need to do that and the game is literally you start um you start the the sort of phase where everyone's talking and you go around you make deals you are like a salesman you're an alien salesman going around to like let's do a deal i'll do this i'll do this for you like okay look, look i'll discount that you can have four instead of five uh or all that kind of thing um and it's it's not just a case of like okay I roll a I roll a die and and see whether or not my sales works you know I just go out and I, I make a sales pitch as a as a person or as a character or whatever um, you know you see that in a lot in in sort of like those dudes on a map war games like it like people who play board games are already role playing yeah you know, even yeah even just kids who are playing Risk they're like oh well you know I'm the big powerful person so I'm going to be really sort of cocky and all that kind of stuff and you know I'm kind of holier than thou because you know you need my respect and sort of thing otherwise I'll wipe you out all that stuff um, so like I like I implore RPG designers to to go out and look at that space and look at what's happening because there's so much stuff there that is just right for the picking for, for making these cool systems. Like, you know, I all of House of Noise Wins mechanics, like it comes from like poker and blackjack and things like that. Like they're not wholly original ideas. Um, so when I'm sat here like talking about how proud I am of them, like I'm also just, I'm just stealing things, right? And it's <laughs> like, that's fine. That's good. <laughs> it's funny because it, it's not only tabletop RPG designers and players who move towards board games. I think it works both ways. And, and yeah. I, that's sort of the initial impulse. Uh, that's what happened. We had war well, games, which are a form of board game, uh, I assume. Uh, you can call them like that. And suddenly, it's, oh, instead of playing armies, we could play individuals. And you play individuals and you role play them even more. At some point, it evolves to the point when it's, it's more about role playing 
the characters, then eventually their fight, and that's a lot of how Dungeons and Dragons fans nowadays. Uh, I read Neo Trad, it was called or OC style of playing. You 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 role play and you you ignore most of the rules, which again, if you're having fun, it's absolutely fine. But it it's it's like we this starting point was sort of strong and shaped a lot of things which came afterwards, and now silos are breaking and there are other things and uh it's a bit like if you would we would see a, a parallel world in which instead of the the first people air quote to do a role-playing game uh would have instead of being of them being war gamers they would have been players of the game of life and they say, oh, actually i really like to pretend i'm really a bride and that i'm married and that <laughs> these are my children and act them out why don't we change the game of life so we do more of that and because you could take any game i mean zombie seed when i play i i role play uh when i played uh there's an excellent uh what's it called uh big trouble in little china uh i wrote we role played the hell out of that you got game like time stories where again it's kind of the board game slowly drifting where towards role playing games stuff like all of Tulu and so on so, so i mean it goes both ways and they, they're not even gonna meet in the middle i think they're gonna cross each other's and at some point it's gonna be just a, a confusing space between the two but uh yeah which, yeah, we... is, which i think is i think is fantastic oh yeah I, definitely I think, yeah let's let's stop having like a big wall between them because there's so much crossover like i, I was um i was recently reading slayers uh by gila rpgs i think it's pronounced or gila um and it's uh, it's a game in which you know you're all monster hunters in like a big city, um, and you all have like very specialist roles. So instead of just being like you know we all play with the exact same mechanics, but I've got this skill and you've got this skill, and I've got plus two to this, whereas you've got plus two to that. In Slayers, like it's asymmetric, so everyone is playing with completely different rule sets that complement each other, but play fundamentally different for each other because they're completely different characters, right? Like. The strategist is not going to have the same interaction with the world as like the you know the sword duelist or, or whatever you want or the you know the person who's like a gunslinger is not going to be you know fighting in the same way that a person with a sword is so um you know the you know the, the whole premise of that game is those roles are not just different in the story but also like the players around the table are going to be doing different things um so i i yeah i want to see more of people sort of not necessarily even just looking at board games and saying, cool, I want to do this for, as a role-playing game, but just seeing how, how varied board games are from each other, how many different ways in which you can interact with other people around the table and, and play different games in different ways. Like, take the exact same setting and like, you know, say it's like ancient Rome or, or, it's, uh, or it's fantasy battles or whatever, and just look at like 10 different games that have tried to replicate that and see how they all have completely different ways of approaching that scenario, right? Um, and I, you know, I think about uh, like, how, how does a dungeon crawl work in a board game and how does it work in an RPG? You look at 10 different RPGs, they feel quite similar. They've just got sort of slight ideas that have been added on top of the generic formula. Whereas with card games and board games, like they all feel so different from each other as long as you're like looking at different sort of uh, ways in which people have interpreted it. So yeah, you've got miniatures on a map, but you've also got, for example, I've got one uh, a home called One Deck Dungeon, which is literally a deck of cards. And every single card is split up into sort of encounters. And then on each like side of the card, there's like a, there's like a piece of loot or there's experience or there's things like that. So the way in which you slot it under your character sheet does different things. Like that's super interesting, right? Or um, you've got, like I was talking about, like hidden role games, for example, you've got um, the way in which there's a, there's a game called Good Cop, Bad Cop, where um, you have sort of three cards in front of you, which represent your loyalty to either team. So you've got the good cops and you've got like the, you know, the, the crooks who are like in, in with the mob or whatever. So you've got blue cards and red cards uh, in front of you. And if you have two blues and one red, so then you're on, you're on the good cop side, right? Um, and but the, the thing about it being a card game is that you can swap people's cards around using things in the game, right? So you might have started on the good guy team, but then get turned crooked. Oh, it's the shield uh... space. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super interesting. Um, and it's like I, 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 just, I just think it's such like I said, it's such a ripe ground for 
for people to just explore that space and, and think about how things work. Like I think sleep away, for example, another any winner is, is something that uses like hidden role mechanics. Um, you know, there's like, we were talking about dread earlier. Like I love dread cause it's, you know, it's a super simple RPG, but in a horror setting where your, your characters are supposed to feel really tense and on edge. Like if you've got a teetering tower in front of you, which when it falls, your character dies, of course you're going to feel tense. Like it's, you know, it's, it's built into the, into the mechanics of the game. You, I was talking to, um, uh, to uh, Jeremy Gage from the Draw Your Dice podcast about um, 10 Candles and how, again, you know, that's a tragic horror RPG in which like you're, you're up against it. You're in the grim darkness of, of whatever setting you choose your characters are terrified and in the dark and, and they don't know what's going to happen to them. So the players are also in that situation. You turn all the lights off. You, you are only lighting your game with 10 actual candles. I just so You've want to this... play that game as soon as COVID. Uh, oh, well. it is fantastic. It's so good. I really, really recommend it's, it. It's um, really on top of my list of the games I really want to play, but I need to find the, the right people and so on. It's up there with yeah, Ali it's, Alice it's is Missing like is another one like yeah, that. Alice is Missing is another incredible one. So, you know, Spencer Stark's a friend of mine, just to uh, make that clear, just in case I, it seemed like I'm endorsing uh, more than I should. But Alice is Missing is a storytelling game in which you're playing teams, um, to, for the benefit of the chat, which you're playing teams uh, who are like witnessing, you know, their friend has gone missing, they're, they're looking at police reports, and you talk to each other via a WhatsApp group, which is such like, it, as soon as I heard that, because I think um, after I after I viewed Icarus by Spencer, like we, we've got to be good friends. And he sent me a message and was like, Oh, do you want a little teaser about the next game I'm working on? And he literally just said, you communicate via WhatsApp. And immediately I was like, I mean, like that, that's such a good idea. Like just as an elevator pitch, that's fantastic. Like just completely um, throwing on its head, everything that you, uh, you anticipate when you play an RPG, like all the ways in which you, know, you think you can do things. I've got a game that's like really on the back burner that I don't know when it's ever going to come out. You play as skeletons, right? So it's like um, you can't talk to other people. Like you can't go around talking to characters, which is like the thing that you spend most of your time doing in most RPGs. Just because I thought, what would that be like? <laughs> like you know, what would it be like if you physically couldn't talk? You know, or um, for example, a game that I wrote with Zoe, um, uh, Would You Search for the Lonely Earth Me, is a journaling game in which you don't play a person, but you play an object. Like you play like a, a treasure that's been like passed around from person to person. Like how does it feel to, in a game that is, you know, a game system that's usually about doing things, how does it feel to be a, a thing that cannot do anything, to be inanimate? Um, like I, I, I'm really interested in games that just sort of like completely turn things on their head, do something wildly different, even if it's like maybe doesn't work all that much, like, you know, Powered by the Apocalypse, for example, is an incredibly popular system. The actual game, like Apocalypse World, is kind of a mess, but it was, it was, an, it was full of ideas that people loved. And, you know, even the designer themselves, I think, have, have said, we prefer the games that other people have made with the systems that we thought up. Um, because, you know, they had those interesting ideas there and they got taken and, and moved on to other things. So like I, you know, that, that is always going to be something that I'm super passionate about. And it's like, I think board games and, and card games and like gambling games and social deduction games, all those kind of things are just like such a fantastic space to look into that kind of stuff and, and just see just how different your mechanics can be, not just your setting, but your mechanics from from everything else that's that's on the market. There's a couple of things I want to mention. First of all, when you mentioned the skeleton, it's not quite you do not talk, but I I, I love plugging a game by Guillaume Gentil. Uh, it's called Sonia and Conan versus the Ninja, and uh, it's a uh, it's a game in which it's not GM less. It's multi GM in the sense of uh, one player plays the barbarian, and the three others three or or two it depends. Uh, play the ninja and the ninja can be whatever but long story short the barbarian is kind of what you would consider a player character while the ninja are sort of three game master who are constrained in what they do but they, they create situation for for the barbarian and one of the little mechanics which is at the core of the game is that uh the barbarians got a list of actions that they can take uh which is limited they can Take them. These are the honorable action, and there are things like crush my enemies, uh, <laughs> sub, uh, sub, sub, seduce, seduce my opponent, 
And then there are dishonorable actions. And for dishonorable action, you roll a d6 and you need to describe it in whatever result you, you do. So if it's a one, you're kill or kiss. <laughs> and it, all the social interaction of the barbarian is limited by two d6s. So you roll two d6 and you, you have the first one is the number of sentences you're going to have. And usually you do one sentence at a time and the, the ninjas react. And the other dice is how many words you're going to have in all those sentences. So you might end up <laughs> just saying two words in three sentences. But usually what happens is the game master are like, ah, oh, barbarian, you've been traveling this wrong road. I know, like, people, like, you, you know, you go in those long speech and the barbarian is like, yes, true. <laughs> and then you move on to <laughs> to the next thing. Uh, reacting on to something else uh, you you mentioned, uh, I I love something they do at the Gauntlet. I have not participated in it yet. It's called Star Wars Sundays or Saturdays. And what they do, uh, there's a couple people there especially. They take a, each time they take different systems, different role playing games. It could be Dread. It could be it could be Alice is missing. Uh, usually things which are some simpler or, or really more focused, but they play it in the setting of Star Wars. So they played Cartel in Star Wars with the huts. Uh, they played kids on bikes, but in Star Wars and so on. So this idea of playing different system in the same setting and having very different experience. And uh, just I, I was mentioning that uh, to finish my reaction to what you were saying is that I, th I think two things are a bit lacking, maybe as in the, the mainstream of the TTRPG community. The first is curiosity towards different systems, or sometimes it's explained saying, oh, I'm not available to learn a new system and so on. It's curiosity. <laughs> you, you've got time to play a game of Dread, I think. Uh, even if you have three campings of Dungeons & Dragons, you could definitely fit a game of, of Dread in there. And the second one, which is... Uh, a bit cultural and it goes ac across the board is and it's a certain culture of play but this idea that uh yeah for for this curiosity also is important when you realize that rules matter rule of cool is nice but the the system can have a purpose in your game uh there are different style of play and again if people are having fun rule of cooling everything and uh, and playing in spite of the rules like a lot of people do with D&D and they're having fun. I think it's great, but I think that they're, they're also missing out on an aspect of the game by playing smaller game, but where the rules really have a strong purpose. And you you don't rule of cool uh, something with very limited games like Dread. You don't rule of cool Dread because there's not that much r rules to respect and if you don't respect it it's not your tower which falls apart but it's the whole experience I think. Yeah like I I think people have got this idea of like um, and, and you know part of it is just you know how difficult is it to learn your system right because if someone's coming in and, and like you say you know they haven't got much time or they uh you know, they maybe haven't, um, they're not as but, invested as they need to be. To or or the, it's, it's the expectation book. also, because when because a lot of people start with D&D, &D, they expect everything to be like D&D &D in terms of investment yeah, exactly. you need. Like I run Star Wars D6 and I, I at a London club and I was almost scared by how many players came to me and said, it's okay, uh, could you give me a copy of the player's handbook for Star Wars D6? And I was like, what? No, you, you, you don't need that. You just... You just show up and we, we work out things. You you don't need to know mm. the class and so on and the, the special moves, which is, you need to know that stuff for D&D &D to, to have a, a, a good experience, not only for yourself, but the other players. Uh, plenty of games, even old ones, you don't need that. Yeah, I think what's what's really funny about D&D &D to me is that like it's the most homebrewed system in the world, which is partly because it's the most popular, but also because it's not very good. Yeah. But, like, <laughs> but um, it's also the one that like everyone expects every other game to be like. But like if you're if you're a person who's been playing D and D their entire life, you know you have at least like three or four different like things that things you never play with because you know you don't like it. Things that you change because you you think that it's an interesting idea or whatever. Like. Nobody ever plays D&D &D exactly how D&D &D is meant to be played for very long, I don't think. 
um, unless they really love it, which you know obviously is fine. Like I'm not I'm not here to to tell you that you're wrong for for liking D and D, but if you're um, like if you're part of the majority, I think you you do kind of just not play D and D how it's supposed to be played. And the reason for that is because like I don't think uh, people get the um, experience that D and D is trying to deliver necessarily. Or and sometimes I don't think D and D knows the experience. That yeah, deliver, yeah, that's a thing. People, I yeah. lately I'm I, quite I happy. They they play it and they're like, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know why you know these parts of the game don't work like this, and they don't realize it's like you know because it's not a game about socializing. It's not a game about romance. It's not a game about uh, you know uh, like s- politics and society or the, or anything like that. Like it's a game about heroes going to the dungeons and stabbing things and getting stronger. Like. So if you do something outside of that, it's not going to be as interesting. Um, so like there's, yeah, there, like you say, there is there is an expectation when people go into other games, um, which is weird for me because like you're, you're playing another game because, you know, you want to try something different, uh, but then you want it to be exactly like the thing that you've already played. So, <laughs> I don't know. It's very odd. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know... Uh... I, I'm quite happy because lately I find there's more and more people coming out of the woods to defend something like Dungeons and Dragons Fourth Edition, uh, which personally is my favorite Dungeons and Dragons, and I, I keep calling it the most honest and self-aware Dungeons and Dragons mm. because it, I I tried other versions before and it was too complicated, confusing me about what I could and could not do, and Fourth Edition really streamlined it, and I learned to enjoy this type of gaming, the dungeon crawling, the tactical aspects, step by step, watch out where you're working, position yourself. And I've, and I, it's not for everyone's taste, but I think it really worked. Uh, for me, it, it speaked and I thought, okay, that's doing that thing. Now I get it. And because historical reason, people reacted poorly for two fourth edition. So I, I think that again, there's a culture. So I think it's both uh, on purpose, and on request that Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition is kind of keeping this arti- artistic blur of yeah yeah we uh, all your leveling up is going to be about more damage hitting more people in the face and so on but actually it's about socializing and cool and story look roll the background roll the a trinket which you'll have in your inventory and forget about it's they, mm. they sort of <laughs> maintain that uh, my latest in theory is that is that people feel empowered by that. And I think it's fair enough that they're sort of empowered to be like, oh, actually I can decide which rules I want and I can do whatever I want with my thing is preset. I think it plays a part for it. But yeah, it's a weird cultural thing. And uh, on one hand, it's great if people are enjoying themselves. On the other hand, it's kind of the tree which hides the forest. And I think a lot of people, mm. not only inside, are missing out on other games, but I saw, I think it's maybe turning off more people outside of the hobby from trying the hobby because they don't realize, hey, you love uh, the young and the restless and this is us and so on. Actually, there's Passion de la Passiones. You could play that. You don't have to, to come here and love Tolkien. Yeah, there's other games for you to play. Yeah, I, yeah, no, I 100% agree. I think it's it's something that hopefully um, now the TTRPGs in general are becoming bigger and becoming more of like of a, of a cultural phenomenon you know like i'm sure that there were other um uh, examples of of things like this where like for, like board games for example right like it's it is now becoming less of a you know the the hobbyists play everything and then you know like the the norms will just play monopoly and risk or whatever because now there are things that are breaching into the mainstream like code names for example it's like ridiculously popular like it's it's getting up to that level of and of like things like monopoly and stuff where it has that sort of like public identity to it or things like for example um like pandemic or uh or like settlers of Catan or whatever so there are there are elements where where board games are now becoming a bit more sort of like uh you know they're at a level of popular and at a level of um like they've been around long enough that people don't just expect that one thing from it. So I, I think maybe we will get that with Dungeons and Dragons, where people will be like, you know, eventually people will start calling them role playing games rather than Dungeons and Dragon games. You know, like I, I think we'll get to that point eventually. I don't know when that'll be, but you know, the more that we, um, you know, the more that we make 
interest in games and the more that we get games from people from different backgrounds and different uh, you know nationalities and religions and and sexualities and and races and creeds and everything like the more that we'll have more experiences for people to be interested in and that will just get people to experiment right you know like it's uh, i'm i'm sure it will be a lot more interesting to you know for example let's say that you've got like a, a trans person who's playing games and they they see something else that's written by and for trans people that's gonna even if they are just a D head that's gonna get them more interested in playing something like that so hopefully with with the um the diversification of the of the industry and things like that and just people in general being more aware of what's going on hopefully that will start to break down the walls because to be honest, like not only is D D not that great a game in my opinion, but also Wizards of the Coast have not necessarily been the most responsible company to be the biggest game in the world. For example, uh, especially with news coming out recently of them making like NFT whatever. Oh no, they did D&D that also. I missed that one. Oh. Yeah, that's 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 been teased. So <laughs> yeah, <there's, laughs> it, it's it will be good to to start toppling that. And if you if you like games about big uh, big organizations being toppled by the little person, then maybe you should buy a copy of The House Doesn't Always Win. <laughs> so there you go. Wait, I wait. think that, that's our time there. Yeah, that's our time. And uh, I was about to create a segue into you giving your data because I was about to say uh, things are changing a bit also thanks to people writing about games, doing videos about games on the Dice Breaker, in Forbes. Uh, I'm, I've been impressed with Forbes, the the range of things they've been covering there in Polygon also, uh, which is starting to do things which don't have Dungeons and Dragons in the title, or they said they would. So we're hoping for more of that. Uh, where can people find you? Where can people order your game? What is going on if I want a fancy physical version? Uh, and uh, yeah, what's your, your goodbye and final plug? Okay, so I am Wheels, um, Michael Wheels Willem. You can find me over on dicebreaker.com. Uh, I'm the head of video, me and uh, my uh, colleague Lolis will be making loads and loads of videos and stuff. On youtube.com forward slash Dicebreaker, we have got someone uh, new joining the team as well. So we're down to two out of three, uh, but we're, we'll be back to full strength very soon, which is going to be very interesting. So make sure you stick around and see some new voices in the industry. Um, you can also find loads of written stuff by uh, like our editor and all of our contributors and our staff writer, Alex Mian, over on Dicebreaker.com. Um, where we've got all kinds of like reviews and interviews and like interesting deep dives and opinion pieces and stuff. So if you're really interested in tabletop, pardon me, as a whole, like it's a, it's a good place to go. And it's it's very much like a beginner friendly place as well. So if you know nothing about board games, you want to be eased in, then like we're a good place to start. Um, and the same is true of RPGs and miniatures and all that kind of thing. Uh, if you want to see more of me personally, you can either find me on Twitch, which I have not been on very much recently because I'm currently on holiday and I've been very busy with the game, but um, I'm over on twitch.tv forward slash oh look it's wheels. Um, but more importantly, you can find all of my games, um, all three that are currently out and all the ones that are coming up, including the one that I'm currently literally writing right now with that tarot deck um, on wheels RPGs. That's W-H-E-E-L-S R-P-G-S dot com. Um, you can find all of my games there. You can also find them on itch on wheelsrpgs.itch.io. Um, so go and have a look at all of those. Uh, the House Doesn't Always Win is out now as a digital edition. So if you want to buy it, you want to play it, then it is out there right now. Uh, some incredible work has gone into that from the editor and all the artists and all the guest writers and stuff. So um, go out and get a copy and revel in it because uh, I'm really proud of it. And I, I hope you very much like it, especially if you have been listening to this and some of the stuff we've been talking about has been interesting you. Yeah, I mean, you you made a, such a strong sales pitch for that game. I, I'm very very excited to, to. I need someone to run it for me now because I, I learn games first by playing them. But yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, if for people watching this on YouTube uh, afterwards or listening to it uh, maybe in audio format, you will find the links to well, maybe not everything because we listed a lot of things, but most of the thing we mentioned. Uh, in the description of the episode, including my own game, uh, Paris Gondo, The Life-Saving Magic of Inventoring, a game in which uh, you play adventurers who need to decide what sparked joy in the inventory, and it's going to decide whether or not they will have a stimulating and invigorating experience still the rest of their life, and first survive uh, leaving the dungeon as well. Uh, so you find a link to that. Uh, you uh, Please go check also our brand new uh, website uh, with other interviews like this one and yeah consider supporting us on patreon follow us on twitch and uh follow us on 
click the subscribe link on YouTube, leave a review, a comment, I always reply. This sort of things that I'm terrible at but very keen to do. Thank you so much, Michael. And uh, yeah, I cannot wait to, to play my first game of uh, the DAO. <laughs> <laughs> I go for Fedor usually because it's a long. All of all of my games have ridiculously long names, so I usually <laughs> usually have some kind of acronym for them. I got I got, I got a no. I've got the the voice of um, Tim Roth in uh, Four Rooms who says, "Don't ever call me Theodore." <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks everyone all right, well, thanks in the chat room. Bye. See you later.